All right, well, as I've already told you this morning, we're breaking into Romans chapter 16. And we're going to look at just two verses, the two verses that have to do with Phoebe. And uh, I, I would just say, you know, it, it's, it's a blessing to be able to, you know, or to be mentioned in the Bible, um, but only if that mention happens to be, you know, a favorable one. There are people mentioned in the Bible unfavorably. We don't want to be in, in that group. But let's not forget that even though our names might not be in the Bible, um, our names are recorded in, in God's book. And, you know, not that he necessarily has a literal book, but he certainly has a recording of what we're doing. And he will not forget even the smallest thing we do for his glory and his praise. So the fact that we're not in the Bible in particular, let's not to be too concerned about that. We, the Lord remembers. And so that's why it's important that we do what we can to honor him. Now, let me begin by reading the passage. Two verses, Romans 16, verses 1 and 2. Paul is writing to the believers in Rome, and he says to them, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church which is in Cancrea, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. Okay, so... What we're looking at this morning is, is Phoebe, and I think we have, um, again, a marvelous example of how the grace of God changes our lives. Now, by way of review, as I told you last week, we were looking at examples of service, and we did see five in particular of the kind of service that our Lord calls us to provide for each other out of love. Now, the first was in the contribution of the churches of Macedonia and Achaia. That's Greece, you know, in the area where Philippi and Thessalonica and also Corinth, where Paul was when he wrote this letter. But they were persecuted, he said. They were impoverished. They were not affluent people. But yet they still gave more, he said, than they reasonably could to relieve the, suffer, the, the suffering and the poverty of their Jewish brethren in Judea. So they were givers. And that's one way that we can serve by giving. Secondly, in Paul's willingness to take this contribution from these churches to Jerusalem to the place where the Jews had been the most hostile towards him, as they were also towards our Lord, in Jerusalem and Judea, to risk his life to serve his Savior and his church. Again, sometimes serving the Lord means that it's not going to be safe. We have to trust the Lord and do what he calls us to do. Third, in the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is our greatest example, who being rich, the infinitely blessed eternal Son of God, became poor, took to himself the poverty of our humanity. And let's, for, let's not forget, even if he had become the richest man in the world, that would still be an infinite stoop. But he stooped even further to become, you know, to really to be born in one of the poorest of families. But he did that, that he might make us rich that he might make us the heirs of heaven. Not rich in the sense that the health and wealth gurus will tell you. You know, he wants you to prosper and be healthy and wealthy and all that. But rich, spiritually rich. Jesus says, don't store up your treasures on earth where thieves can steal and they can become corrupted by rust and moth and so forth. But lay up your treasures in heaven. The way we do that is by serving the Lord. Fourth, we saw Paul's willingness to visit the church at Rome. Remember, he had evangelized the whole eastern Mediterranean. Amazing. But now he wanted to go to the western part, to the furthest most regions, which would be Spain in those days. And on the way, he wanted to visit the believers in Rome because he had never been there in order that he might serve them, that he could minister his gifts to them and encourage them by his faith. And then the fifth example we saw was in the prayers the Roman believers were offering for Paul that he asked them to offer, and surely they gave to him. That he would be delivered from the unbelieving Jews when he actually did go to Jerusalem because he hadn't yet gone, and that his service would be accepted by the saints who were in Jerusalem so that he would be able to come to the Roman church in joy and find refreshing rest in their company. Actually, if you, as you look through Scripture, what you see is example after example of service. 
um, we are to serve one another, and in doing so, we're serving the Lord, and that is really the path to true blessing in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive, and I think we all understand something of that because God blesses us when we give and particularly when we sacrifice something for Him. All right, our passage this morning again focuses on the importance of service, and this time in the example of Phoebe who is called a servant of the church at Kincrea. Now, I want us to see a few things here. First of all, I want us to see that Paul commends Phoebe to the Romans. That commendation means something, okay? It's not that, hey, look, here's Phoebe. I just want to kind of single her out, and um, you don't know her, but I just want you to know she exists, and she's a servant. That, that's not what's going on here. Now, we need to remember that Paul was at Corinth when he wrote this letter. Phoebe was from Kincrea. Now, Kincrea is a port of Corinth, about nine miles away toward the east. Now, from her name and from her location where she was, she's likely a Gentile, a Gentile convert. And the fact that Paul calls her sister obviously means that she was a genuine believer. But that he commends her to the Romans means that she was likely the one who delivered Paul's letter to them. And so Paul is introducing her. You know, the idea of introductions used to be much more important uh, in culture than it is today. You know, if you watch, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Pride and Prejudice, uh, the five-hour version, I commend it to you. It's very clean, very interesting. But no one would ever dare go up to a complete stranger and begin to talk to them. They, they had to have an introduction first. And that's what Paul is doing. He's introducing Phoebe. He's commending her. He's saying, you can receive her because, you know, she is from me and she is safe. Uh, there were people in those days that um, may very unscrupulously want to infiltrate the church and take advantage of Christians. Well, Paul is vouching for Phoebe. Now, that was her character, okay? A servant. Um, and she was serving Paul by bringing this letter to the Romans, but this was also her ministry. Notice Paul calls her in verse 1 a servant of the church, which is at Kincrea. Now, here's where things can get a little bit interesting and perhaps a bit controversial, and so we want to kind of, you know, plumb what, what is it that Paul is saying here? Well, you know, as you look through the New Testament, if you had the, you know, the tools necessary and looked up every use of the word servant, you would find there's actually several different words that are used for the word servant. Uh, and most of those, you know, they're, they're just common words, they're not controversial, but there is a word that's used here that can be controversial. The word here is diakonos. Does that sound familiar? This is the word from which we get the word deacon. Okay? Now, we know that deacon is one of the two offices in the church. The other one is that of the elder, also called overseer. Now, the first thing we need to see about this word is that it doesn't always refer to the office, okay? Now, we need to see that that's clear. It has two basic meanings, related meanings in the New Testament, really only two. It can mean simply someone who provides service, you know, somebody who helps somebody else. Uh, Mary, for instance, called the servants at the wedding of Cana in Galilee. She called them deacons. Oh, we know they weren't deacons. Jesus told his disciples that they were to become deacons to one another, to each other. Uh, Matthew 20, verse 25 and 26. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your deacon, okay? Shall be your diakonos, shall be your servant. Paul even calls the magistrates deacons because they serve on God's behalf. Remember Romans 13? We went through that just a few weeks ago in verses 3 and 4. Rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise for the same. For it is a deacon, a minister of God to you for good. 
But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not, the bear, it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a deacon, it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Well, we know that you know, the magistrates, the mayor of the city, the governor of this state, not a deacon in the church. Paul even calls Christ a deacon. He says, who has become a servant or deacon to the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers, Romans 15, verse 8. And Paul even calls himself and Apollos deacons. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5. What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Deacons through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. And what he means, obviously, is these were all servants. The word can just simply mean servant, but it can also refer to the office. Paul addresses the deacons. You know, it's interesting. There's only two mentions of deacons in the Bible using that word for the office. One of them is in the introduction to the letter. Paul writes to the church at Philippi. He says in Philippians 1 verse 1, Paul and Timothy bondservants of Christ Jesus, and that would be a different word, not deacon, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who were in Philippi, including the overseers, that would be the elders, and deacons. Here he's singling them out as an office, and we're going to look at that in just a moment. And he also lists the qualifications for this office in his first letter to Timothy. Now, as I read this, think about what I read for the meditation. Okay, 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13. Put on your thinking caps. What is Paul talking about here? Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, prudent in all things. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now, are you confused? Okay. Well, you should be confused. This has created no end of controversy in the church. Okay. Now, the question is, which of these two meanings should we apply to, to Phoebe? Certainly, the first meaning applies to her. She was definitely a servant. Okay? She served the church in Cancrea. She served Paul by delivering this letter to the Romans. By the way, in serving Paul, she was also serving the Lord because he wanted this letter taken to the Romans, and he wanted it preserved for us so that we could be reading and studying it so many centuries later. Okay, her name also heads a long list of servants in Romans 16. She's a servant. Okay. But could she also have been a deacon? Could she have been what has been called in church history a deaconess? Well, there's a few things that we should think of that may be in favor of this position. But before we consider that, Let's consider what this office actually entails and what it doesn't, because that will help us, I think, kind of get over the hurdle that we might have in our thinking against the idea of, the, of women deacons, okay? Now, as I mentioned before, there are two offices in the New Testament church. I think there's only two offices, and that's elder and deacon. Now, elders are called by the Lord Jesus Christ to teach and to govern in the church under Christ. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 5, verse 17, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. Do you notice that Paul says there are, well, two things, maybe three, that elders do. They rule, okay? They rule and they teach and preach. Now, this is how Jesus exercises his headship, how he exercises his authority in the church. He does it through ordained men, through elders. And that's why Paul says they have to be qualified, why they, they need to study God's word. 
They need to know his truth. They need to be able to communicate it accurately. Paul tells Timothy that the elder in 1 Timothy 3, 2 must be able to teach. And what that means is to understand what he's talking about and, and to be able to explain it in a way that people can grasp, that they can understand. So the word means skillfully. And he tells Titus that the elder must be in Titus 1, 9. He must hold fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. So the elder's responsibility is to, the way it's put, I think, simply in our form of government, is to declare what Jesus says in his word, tell God's people what Jesus says, and then minister that word, okay? The elders don't have you know, carte blanche authority. They, they don't say, you know, I think you should go jump off a cliff and you need to obey me, you know, this type of thing. That's not at all what an elder's authority is. But rather, it's this is what Christ's will is. This is what he says. This is what we need to do, okay? Now, this is also why Paul tells us, and this is a controversial matter today, that elders are to be men. Now, it shouldn't be so controversial because the Bible is really quite clear but it is because of the way things are shaping up in our society with regard to you know, feminism and the idea that everyone is equal. With, well, there, yes, everyone is equal in, in many regards, but when it comes to the church, the Lord has ordained that, that men hold this office. He, he says in 1 Timothy 3.1, if any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work that he desires to do. And why is it that God only wants men, well, again, this may seem, and I don't, I don't want you to take it this way, it may seem demeaning to women, it is not at all, because God has really ordained that men protect women, okay? Whatever, if they have any superiority at all, whether it be in strength, and, and some men are not superior to some women in strength, but I think generally overall, you know, that, that may be the case, if that is the case, whatever we have, it is to be used to serve, to serve those who are weaker, to protect, okay? So that's clear. But Paul writes this to Timothy. And, and this, I think it's quite clear, 1 Timothy 2.12. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. Now, to be an elder, she would have to do both. So the fact that Paul says, first of all, if a man desires this office, it is a good work he desires to do, and he talks about those qualifications purely in terms of qualifications for men. And then he also says women are not to teach or exercise authority over men, and the only reason given that Paul gives for that is because Eve was deceived first. So that is how the Lord has ordained things. Okay. Now, deacons, on the other hand, they have neither a governing nor a teaching ministry. Their ministry is purely that of service, a service of mercy, something that all of us are actually called to do. We look in the Bible, I mentioned that there's only two places where the word deacon is mentioned, but there is another place where they're mentioned, they're just not called deacons. And that's when they were originally set aside to minister to a need that involved the whole fellowship. If you'll think back to uh, Acts chapter 6, when you had all these people converted, the day of Pentecost and all these needs, there was a complaint that came from the Hellenistic Jews, and the Hellenistic Jews are those that lived outside of Palestine. They lived throughout the Roman Empire. They were not Judean or Galilean Jews. That they were you know, dispersed through the nations, but they were still there because they were being discipled after being converted on the day of Pentecost, and because of all these people and all the needs, we saw people... Disciples selling property to meet those needs, and we, we see this need arising, the need among their widows, and they were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. And so we read in Acts 6, verses 3 through 4, the apostles gathered the disciples and said to them, Select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, here we see that distinction again. The ministry of mercy 
the ministry of the word and prayer. And those are divided between the, the two separate offices. Now, because needs like this continued to exist in the church, deacons later became an established office. We saw that in Paul's greeting to the Philippians, and we saw that in the qualifications that he gives in 1 Timothy 3. But now we need to return to our question, okay? Could Phoebe have been a deaconess? Now, there are some arguments in favor of that position. First of all, Phoebe is called a diakonos. Now, that may not seem very compelling, but, you know, because especially because it's used as, as, uh, as a word for servant. Now, yes, it can mean servant, but some have argued. As a matter of fact, my New Testament professor, I still remember him in, in seminary, even though it's been many years ago, saying that this was irrefutable evidence that Phoebe was a deaconess. The fact that when she is called a deacon, that the masculine form of the word is used. Now, in, in Greek, you've got masculine, feminine, and neuter, you know, he, she, and it. And when you're using a noun, that noun will have a feminine form if it's referring to a woman. If it's referring to a thing, it'll have a neuter form. If it's referring to a man, it will have a masculine form. Well, here's a noun, deacon, servant, in the masculine form, and Paul is saying Phoebe, who is clearly from her name a, a woman, is being called by this masculine noun. And that seems to be irrefutable evidence. Uh, well, you look in the lexicons, though, and you find out that the masculine form is always used, whether it's a man or a woman, you know. But I'm sure that my New Testament prophet understood that. He was no slacker when it came to Greek. But maybe it says that because it's applied to Phoebe, <laughs> you know. And so it must be feminine, too, because it's applying to her. Well, the argument is that because it's being used in the masculine form, she was holding the office. So that's one thing. By the way, that word, diakonos, is actually used in the feminine form in the scriptures, but it never applies to a person. It only applies to, a, to service, service in general. Sometimes, what do you want to say, abstract concepts, action, service is an action now can be in the different, you know, uh, genders. It doesn't have to be neuter because it's a thing, okay? So service, the idea of service, doing service for someone, that appears in the feminine form uh, universally. All right, second argument. H.G. E. Robertson, the great Greek scholar who has written the largest Greek grammar ever written. It's about this thick. Uh, he knew the Greek language very well, and he says the fact that she's called a servant or a deacon of the church at Cancrea means that she was most likely a deaconess in that church. You know, he didn't have any qualms saying that that's the case because, because of the fact that she is a servant of the church. Thirdly, we've already seen that it's quite possible that Paul, in giving the qualifications for deacon, also gives the qualification that must be true of a woman who would qualify to be a deaconess in 1 Timothy 3. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Now, A.T. Robertson, again, the Greek scholar, said, this can mean that the deacons' wives have to meet these qualifications before the deacons themselves can qualify for the office. He says, yes, it's possible. It could refer to the deacon's wives because that word can mean woman or women or wives. But the odd thing is, why would the deacon's wives have to meet this qualifications when nothing is said of the elder's wives? You know, it doesn't say the elder's wife has to be this and that and so forth for the elder to qualify. Why would, he, why would the deacons, you know, have to have wives have these particular qualifications. It seems more likely that he's saying women who would do this service for the church must also have these qualifications. And then fourthly, actually I have I think two more arguments. Fourthly, it's possible that Paul is speaking of deaconesses in 1 Timothy 5. And if he is, this would clear up a lot of really difficulty with this text when he's talking about the widow indeed. 
me. Oh, let, let me read. Well, first of all, let me describe the widow indeed. Um, there were many uh, needful people, very, very many uh, in the church, even widows, okay? And by the way, the church was very sensitive to widows and to orphans because they were those who were most destitute and most in need. Paul is talking about a list in 1 Timothy 5 that a widow might or might not be added to. And he gives qualifications. Well, the widow has to be not less than 60 years old. She has to have done certain things. And if she's young, she should remarry. If, if she has uh, those of an extended family that can take care of her, they should take care of her. But then there's this widow indeed, this widow who's over 60, this widow who doesn't have anybody to take care of her. She's absolutely destitute. But then he gives these qualifications. Listen to these in, in 1 Timothy 5, 9 through 10. A widow is to be put on the list only if she's not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, having a reputation for good works, and if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work. Now, but is Paul saying the church can't help widows unless they meet these qualifications? Is that what he's saying? Or is he saying that this widow is not to be put on the list of servants of the church unless there's nobody else that can take care of her and she must have a reputation for having done service, okay? She has to be somebody who is given to service. She must have these gifts. Well, it's quite likely that's what he was referring to. And let me just mention my last, my last one is just simply quoting an authority. Oh, and giving an argument from reason. There are things that a woman can do in serving, especially other women, that a man can't do. And John Calvin recognized that. That's the reason why he believed deaconesses were necessary. And, you know, Calvin was very, very strict, which he should have been, you know. He did not do anything that he did not find warrant for in Scripture. And where did he find warrant for deaconesses? Well, he found it in the passage that I just quoted, 1 Timothy 5. He says these women were obviously deaconesses. So what can we say? We can, we can say this. At the very least, Phoebe was a servant. She served the Lord. She served the Lord faithfully. She served Paul by taking the letter to Rome. She served the saints in Cancrea, and Paul is holding her out to the church in Rome and to us as an example of what we are all called to be. We are all called to be servants. Now, finally, let me just mention this. Paul calls the Roman believers to receive her in a way that is fitting for the saints, to welcome her into the fellowship as a sister in Christ. Again, letters of commendation were very important in those days. He also called them to help her in whatever need she might have to show her hospitality by giving her room and board. I mean, she's taking this trip on her own dime, and she needs their help. And that, she, that they should give her this help because she herself has helped many. Okay, remember how we saw last week that when somebody gives to us, it obligates us to give back to them. You know, the Lord says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Don't always be on the receiving end but try as much as possible to be on the giving end as the Lord allows. Now, remember last week we saw that Paul was telling the churches of Macedonia and Achaia, he says, as you have received the blessings that God meant for the Jews in Judea, so you should minister also to them uh, in physical things because of all that you've received from them. So we see the same here. Okay, the Romans had benefited from Phoebe, and we might ask, well, how? Well, she delivered Paul's letter to the Romans, and that was a great treasure that she had given to them. And so they were to take care of her in return. So as there are those who minister to us, we are to minister to them. Actually, if we're always giving, we don't have to worry about anything else. And we really should, should do that unless we're in a position, and some of us are, where we really do need help. And then we shouldn't be afraid to receive help, okay? We, we need help. God wants us to receive that help 
from one another. Okay, so we need to be aware of the needs around us and try to help others. But there's one last thing that I wanted to just say. If somebody comes to us who is in need, who has served the Lord and served his people faithfully, even if they haven't served us personally, now, who, who would those people be? Well, I mean, have you ever listened to R.C. Sproul? Have you ever benefited from these teachers that we've been listening to? Have, have, what about missionaries who are serving on the field and they come here and they tell you about the work they're doing? Um, evangelists, you know, others, okay, they're serving the Lord and they're laying themselves out in order to do this. It is right for us also to minister to them, okay, to minister to their needs, to pay back their kindnesses uh, to others, to pay them back to them, okay? And remember that as we do this, whether we show kindness or we serve one another, whether, you know, you may have served me or, or not, okay, or serving those that may come who have been servants of the Lord, we do need to remember that when we serve anyone who belongs to Jesus, we are serving Him. Let me just remind us what we saw last week, what Jesus is going to say at the great judgment. Matthew 25, verse 40, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it, you know, visited me when I was in prison or when I was sick or clothed me when I was, when I was naked or, you know, gave me food when I was hungry, truly to the, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Do you want to love Jesus? Do you want to bless Jesus? Okay, then bless even the least of his brethren. That's how you bless him, okay? It's how you serve him. And he also says in Mark 9, verse 41, for whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. Now, in this case, we're the one giving the cup of cold water to a follower of Christ. Jesus says whoever does that will not lose their reward because when we serve one another, we are serving our Lord Jesus. Well, let's, um, let's be encouraged, you know, from these examples to be servants, to, to seek to serve one another. When we find a need, you know, to, to try to do what we can to, to meet that particular need and, and not just wait for somebody else to see it and, and meet that, you know, to, to do something. Let's pray that Jesus would make us more and more like him. Well, let's bow in just a, you know, a few moments of prayer and let's, let's ask God for the grace to do this.